Lord be with you. But we are in more states of uncertainty. Um, Safer at Home has been lifted here in our state. Um, our county has finally put some um, safe return guidelines in place. But even with all of that going on, uh, we're still trying to figure out, uh, along with everybody else, small businesses, organizations, uh, even churches, we're trying to figure out what are the next steps? So what does that look like? How do we do that? And as we have been thinking and contemplating these things recently, it's caused me to go back and think about um, what it felt like when all of this first started so long ago. Uh, I remember when all of a sudden worship just abruptly stopped. Uh, In-person meetings just abruptly stopped. And uh, for those of us who are ministers, that was very unsettling. Um, it caused a lot of anxiety because so much of what we do is based upon being present with people. Uh, we pray for the sick in their presence. We uh, counsel the brokenhearted in their presence. Um, we anoint the dying um, and sit with those who are grieving. Uh, we gather together and lead worship and all of those things are in-person activities. So when all of a sudden you can't do those things anymore, uh, it just causes this incredible disorientation and re-examination of who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. So I'll never forget the, uh, the turning point for me was weeks and weeks after um, people had been quarantined and isolated from one another in most major ways. Um, I was on a, a Zoom meeting, of course, because you couldn't meet in person, uh, with other pastors um, in kind of a, a spiritual setting. We were trying to um, lament together. We were trying to talk about our frustrations. We were trying to pray together and seek some sort of solace in the Lord uh, seek what it was that the Spirit was doing in each and every one of us and how we might have kind of some, some group think about that. And there was a, a pastor uh, in another state who said um, that while she has been dealing with these situations and this shift in ministry, um, she's been coping with it by acknowledging that this is her ministry of absence. And I thought that was such a profound statement. Um, I had never heard those words put together before, ministry and absence. I think most of us ministers, um, we assume our identity and base it off of Jesus, who we see primarily as incarnate. Uh, it's his incarnation that gives us the example for what we think ministry is supposed to be. So. Um, he desired so much to lead and to be with his people that he put on flesh and blood and dwelt among us. Therefore, uh, we in flesh and blood go minister to others on behalf of Jesus. In a very real way, we, we believe that we stand in the gap between God and that person who is seeking God's activity in their life. Uh, so we act as the flesh and blood on behalf of God for that person. So this idea of uh, ministry and absence um, was very foreign to me, and I have thought about that uh, in the weeks that have followed. And I have wondered, uh, is this true? And if so, if there is such a thing as a ministry of absence, uh, what does it mean? What does it look like? How do you do it well? And even is it biblical? Is there evidence of this uh, in God's holy word? What I found over the ensuing weeks is that um, it is, there does seem to be an evidence of that. Uh, it's very subtle. So right from the beginning in the garden experience, you've got um, humanity and their creator in close proximity. Uh, they were intimate with God. God was intimate with them, walking with them, being present with them, speaking with them, interacting with them. Uh, and although we know that that is a, a huge aspect of our faith, we know it's also the end goal of our faith, that one day uh, we believe we are going to be present with God again in a very 
uh, not only spiritual but physical way, that we'll see him, we'll be able to eat with him, uh, we'll be able to interact with him and touch him and be touched by him. So physical presence is very much a part of our beginning story and our ending story. But what we find in the narrative of redemption in between is a lot of absence. Uh, God, after humanity rebelled or rejected uh, his word and his instruction, uh, and they were uh, banished from the garden, uh, God sort of withdrew at that point. Uh, we do see God continuing to interact and manifest himself to people uh, throughout the remainder of the scripture, but it's less and less. It's almost like the idea of people went on with their lives as if God wasn't there. And as a matter of fact, um, we learn by the time we get to the Psalms that that's uh, the biggest lament of a fool, uh, someone who believes that God isn't there, that there is no God. They can't see the evidence because of God's absence. Uh, we do find that God uses his presence and his absence in various ways with differing individuals all throughout Scripture. Uh, one of the more notable examples in the negative sense is with King Saul. So you have this story in 1 Samuel 13 of um, Saul uh, being king. He's already been chosen by God. He's already been anointed and established as the king of all Israel. And yet, um, even though he's done good things for the monarchy, there's this, this section where he is on the verge of war with the Philistines. Uh, and the Philistines have gathered on uh, their side of uh, a ravine, and Saul and his army has gathered on their side, and they're waiting. They're waiting for seven days because Samuel the prophet has told Saul that he would show up in seven days and uh, presumably bless the army and make a sacrifice offering to God on their behalf. And what happens is at the end of seven days, Samuel doesn't show up. He is absent. And Saul begins to see uh, the anxiety and fear in his army. Uh, people begin fleeing and running away. And finally, Saul takes it upon himself to offer the sacrifice for the people uh, to God. And then, of course, right after he does that, Samuel shows up and asks him, what have you done? And when Saul explains himself and his reasoning, which may seem very logical and reasonable to us, uh, Samuel chastises him for that and seems to say, uh, this time of absence should have been for you, King Saul, an opportunity to draw closer in your trust and in your hope in the Lord instead of trying to take matters into your own hands. We see in the exile um, God using absence again, uh, even though he distances himself from his people and uh, they saw it in a lot of ways as God abandoning them or rejecting them. Uh, we see that God continues to work behind the scenes in very subtle but hopeful ways to use that period of absence for them uh, as a way to build their faith. And then finally, we get to Jesus uh, the one whom we primarily think of as the incarnate God being among us. And I found this very interesting passage of scripture in the Gospel of John, chapter 16. Uh, Jesus is speaking to his closest disciples on the night of his betrayal. So this is one of his last conversations with them. Uh, and he's been telling them some very hard things. He's been preparing them for his upcoming absence. And of course, they don't understand it. Uh, they don't know what to do with it, uh, and Jesus notices this. So uh, beginning in verse 19, he says, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish 
because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. The very words of our eternal God. Now here we have the incarnate Jesus telling his disciples uh, he is going away, and that time of absence is going to be for them sorrow and grief. But that at the end of that period, there will be joy again for them, joy that no one can take away. Uh, of course, for them, in the short term, that meant Jesus' death and burial. And during that three-day period, um, there was going to be this loss, this absence, this grief, this disorientation. Uh, but they would experience joy again when they experienced the new and resurrected Jesus. But then Jesus left this world again. He ascended back to be with the Father. And uh, we in the church here have just recently celebrated the ascension of our Lord Jesus, uh, 40 days after Easter. And that's another reminder that he is absent from us right now. He is not bodily present with us as he was during his earthly ministry. And yet, according to the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So clearly, the church is to be learning something in the, the physical absence of Jesus. Certainly, we are still being shaped and formed, and, and absence is a part of who we are. So if that is true, um, what does it mean for us to have a ministry of absence, especially in a time like this? And I think there have been examples for us um, in recent memory uh, that, that can guide us and, and help us to learn how to be absent in ways that are meaningful and helpful for other people. Um, I look at the monastic communities, both of old and of recent times, and how they purposely chose to withdraw from the world. Uh, they stepped back from the organized church on purpose, uh, because they saw, whereas the church was being helpful uh, with people in an incarnate way, in a present way, and trying to do things, the church often got bogged down by the ministry of the moment, and sometimes they were missing the bigger picture. So these faithful women and men saw their calling from God to withdraw from the present church and to isolate themselves and to dedicate their lives to prayer. They believed that praying for the church and for the world from a distance, from an absence, was one of the best things that they could do. And I pray that we learn that same lesson. Beloved, we are all in a ministry of absence right now. It doesn't matter if you are a pastor or if you are a deacon or an elder, uh, if you are a lay leader or if you are just someone who gathers for worship, um, we are all part of the body of Christ. We are all a kingdom of priests on behalf of our Lord. And therefore, we are all to be serving our Lord. And maybe one of the best ways, if not one of the only ways, that we can do that in these uncertain times is through our ministry of absence. Uh, maybe we need to write some letters. Maybe we need to send an email or a text or give a phone call. And all of those things are good and helpful ways that we can still connect with people. But even more important than that, maybe we just need to be praying. Praying for the world and praying for individuals by name, even if those people never know that we prayed for them in the first place. Let us learn how to be good in our ministry of absence so that when we can be present together again without all of this uncertainty and all of these details to be worked out, uh, we learn how to do that even better. So as I have begun saying in these new series of videos, as these times are continuing to change, in this time of our ongoing pandemic, the peace of God be with you.
Amen.